Hello and welcome to this instalment of the Wyndham Yacht Club's Getting to Know Port Phillip Bay series. Today uh, we're going to have a look at some places that you might like to visit around Port Phillip that uh, involve anchoring rather than visiting a harbour. My name is Robert Bradley and I'll be uh, guiding you around Port Phillip and having a look at some of the places you might like to visit either for a couple of hours or for a lunch stop or uh, even in the right um, weather conditions you might choose to stay there overnight. It's a way of getting away from some of our uh, more populated areas on the coast of Port Phillip and exploring it a little further. In many cases, these are places that either will find it difficult to get to by car or you'll just get a different perspective on them. So having a look at the um, overall Port Phillip there that you can see on the chart and of course the yellow and grey bits there are the land. Um, but the more interesting bit uh, once we get onto the water is the depth of the waters. So the white areas are the deep bits, the light blue areas are the um, slightly shallower bits and the dark blue bits are the inshore. And the good thing about Port Phillip is that most of it, particularly that bit um, there in the middle, most of it is a dish shaped. So once you get away from the shore, particularly the eastern shore there you'll see, you're um, in reasonably safe water and most of the obstructions are um, along close to the shore and they're generally well marked as we go around here or if there are any that aren't particularly well marked I'll make sure I point them out to you. But um, that rule applies to most areas except once we get down to the south end of the bay here and we'll have a closer look at that. This area known as the Great Sands um, includes, and I'll just put a little marker there on it, it includes Mud Island which actually isn't mud it's mostly sand but uh, it's basically the Great Sands is a sandbar that's um, accumulated all the day. But you'll see that uh, there are quite a few shallower areas around there. The green bits that I didn't mention earlier, the green bits are what we call the intertidal zone. That's the bit that covers and uncovers the tide comes. If you were down at the beach, you'd call it the beach. And the bit that you run up and down as the waves chase you up and down. But um, we'll come back to that Great Sands just towards the end. The other good thing about Port Phillip is not only is it this nice dish shape, which means that uh, once you get away from the shores, you pretty much um, are away from the hazards, it doesn't actually get all that deep. And by all that deep, I mean it doesn't get too deep to anchor. And I've uh, taken you here to the middle of Port Phillip where it's at its deepest, and you'll see that um, those little numbers there represent the depth of water in metres. So uh, you can see that it's about 24 metres in the middle, and with a reasonable length of rope attached to your anchoring gear, even a small boat that only carries a little bit of chain and a reasonable length of um, rope or warp, will be able to at least stop for an hour or two in calm conditions. Most of the, um, the seabed, and we call it the nature of the seabed around Port Phillip, is sand, which is excellent for anchoring, with a look at the, what we call the top end of Port Phillip. And that's the area around Williamstown, down the southeastern suburbs there. And anywhere around here, there are some good anchoring points. And I'll take you into, to begin with, we'll take you into Williamstown Beach. Generally, that green area around there, those of you that are familiar with the area will be used to it being rock. But the actual bit of beach at Williamstown is a nice sandy beach in there. And you can anchor off that beach quite comfortably um, for an hour or two and enjoy the sights and scenery there. Similarly if we head across to the southeastern suburbs anywhere pretty much from and you're looking at uh, St Kilda there, St Kilda around to Port Melbourne, anywhere down this coast here and we'll just scan down it. There's Elwood, we're going to get to Brighton in a minute and we'll go as far as Sandringham. Anywhere down there um, you can generally find your way into the beach until you find a suitable depth of water three to five metres, something like that, drop anchor and enjoy your time there. You'll notice there are a couple of obstructions down here, they're the things, um, and I'll just put little crosses on them for you, there's one, isolated danger mark, and here's another one, a reef marked by a couple of cardinal marks. So even the good thing about the occasional obstruction that isn't right on the shoreline here is that in this particular area they're reasonably well marked. The problem is that as uh, the day wears on and the sun warms up the land, it creates an effect called a sea breeze. And in Melbourne, on Port Phillip, that sea breeze will sometime around about 3 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon turn into anything up to a 20-knot southerly wind. And I'll 
I'll go out a little bit further, all the way from down there at Sorrento, or Port Sea, or Rosebud down the bottom there, it's got Rosebud label on it down here, that's about 30 nautical miles across the water. And in terms of building up waves, that's quite a long way. And what that means is that by the time that wind is blown across the water all the way up to the top end of Port Phillip, it's created a sea state, anything up to one and a half or two metres. And whilst that might be nice if you're on the beach and you're trying to have a bit of a body surf, it's not so good when you're sitting in a boat trying to enjoy your afternoon um, happy hour. And that's one of the downsides of the top end of Port Phillip. In later in the evening, then around about 7 or 8 o'clock, it'll die out fairly quickly and you'll go back to a nice peaceful evening. But for that reason, we're going to work our way around some of the other areas of Port Phillip. I'm not going to dwell too long on Altona Bay. And the reason I am going to pass by here is just to point out that there is a little reef there called Altona Reef. The good news is on this occasion, it's well marked. But we'll progress around to Point Cook. Because here we start to find ourselves at some interesting little spots that you might want to anchor where you'll get a different perspective on things because we start to get to this uh, coastline and I'll just um, pan out again this coastline around what I'll call the southwestern which is nowhere near as uh, well populated particularly on the coast as the southeastern suburbs and all the way down the Mornington Peninsula so here we start to get some remote areas not quite wilderness but certainly we're going to have a look at a couple of coastal parks in a minute that are quite significant in terms of the local bird populations and what they contribute. And you can anchor off these and have a bit of a look at them. So the first one here is we're going to stop and look in Altona Bay and um, as we get a bit further around to Campbell's Cove on either side of Point Cook. So anywhere, and I'll just put a couple of markers on there for you, anywhere around here. Um, you'll get some nice little um, spots to drop anchor. So we can see that um, that's Point Cook, uh, where is this Point Cook Co Coastal Park, not surprisingly, but we can see that area around there in light green is in fact in, it's a coastal park. So if you've um, anchored off the beach here, you're going to be in an area that's um, not uh, confronted by roads and cars, but by, um, in one case, the Cheetah. Cheatham wetlands. Now Cheatham used to be the salt works, for those of you that don't remember the name, but um, it's now a coastal park, as is the Point Cook Coastal Park. Once again, a good spot for a quick stop. Um, Wyndham Harbour in the middle of here, but uh, obviously we're not going to stop there because we don't have to anchor there. What we can do though is have a look at the Werribee River, and whilst it's not ideal for anchoring of larger boats, anything up to about a draft of a metre and a half with a bit of careful negotiation can make it into the river entrance or you might choose to anchor outside the river and take your dinghy up the up the river there and I'll just read you um, from the Parks Victoria website their um, two sentence description of the Werribee River which says uh, the river and wetlands provide an opportunity to see a diversity of water birds and enjoy recreational activities such as fishing and kayaking whilst the majestic River red gum trees provide shelter and line the river. The park also contains numerous artefact scatters, indicating a long history of Aboriginal occupation of the area. And you can um, you can navigate in a dinghy or something similar a fair way up the Werribee River, and certainly as far as the red cliffs at the golf course, which is about where that um, chart is showing. The Parks Victoria website, and we'll just move down to. Um, the Werribee River there, and I'll just highlight it for you, yeah, there we go, Werribee River Park extends um, up one side of the river and joins up with the Werribee Open Range Zoo Precinct, which is also a Parks Victoria area, and pointed out just on that horseshoe bend there, um, where the um, where K Road approaches the river, that's uh, the Red Cliffs area and the golf course is in there, and that's... Um, about as far as you can get in your dinghy, but certainly worth the trip. And I'm just going to move on to one of my my new favourite areas, which is this area in here called, um, and variously called, the Spit. Or if we just zoom in a little bit, we'll see that the name of this point here is Wedge Spit. This little bay in here um, I've tried out recently, and 
excellent little um, anchorage. You can get right in close to the beach. There's nothing much there. It's very secluded. And on most any days, I should say, when the wind is from um, anywhere in the north or even round to the west, it's very well sheltered and very flat. And excellent place to spend a night. Once again, we can see a couple of markers here. This one out here, this cardinal mark, isn't marking a um, immediate danger, but it's giving you a reference point of where to start to make your way. And I'll just give you a little dotted line so make your way into the bay in a safe manner so that you miss this thing over here. This one here is a little more proximate to the hazard, and what we're showing there is, in fact, that little thing there's a rock, so we want to keep clear of those. But once again, we've got a good safe reference point out here to start from. I'll just note for you down here we've got a um, mussel farm. Best to keep out of those uh, for several reasons. Uh, the far mussel farmers take a dim view of you navigating through there and your boat's propeller will take a dim view of getting the ropes that they use to grow the mussels uh, wrapped around it as well. Working around from there we can see that um, this area in here also we can uh, find our way into. Just watching where we drop the anchor here, but um, the bit that I really reason I'm interested in this bit is I'm going to swap uh, maps again and we're going to have a look at the Parks Victoria map. This whole area um, that we're looking at down there that I've got um, highlighted on there is the Spit Wildlife Reserve. And similar to the the Werribee River, there's a little description on the Parks Victoria website that gives us some insight into this uh, far lesser known park. And it describes um, the Spit Wildlife Reserve as follows. The reserve's tidal inlets and coastal wetlands play an important role in the conservation and protection of a significant number of resident and migratory birds. In recognition of these values, the area is part of a wetland of international significance listed under the Ramsar Convention. And that's uh, the Ramsar Convention that affect migratory bird species. And that's birds that are migrating tens of thousands of miles. And this is one of them. The last little bit I'm going to have a look down here is there's a couple of little coves in here. Similarly, um, we've, we note a couple of hazards here. That's a little uh, mark, as you can see. They are two South Cardinal marks for those of you that are less familiar with um, the Boyd system. Okay. We're now, if we zoom out a little bit, we're now getting to the spots where you'll find that that southerly breeze, southerly sea breeze that we get, isn't quite such a problem because the distance across the water is nowhere near as great, which means that the uh, wave build-up isn't anywhere near as great either. But it gives us a good chance to switch across to the southern shore. And before I do that, I'm just going to... because somebody's going to say, what about Corio Bay? I'm going to say, there's Corio Bay. We're not going to talk about it. It's boring. It's Geelong. Um, if you want to go to Geelong, drive down there. If you want to stop in Geelong, go and stop at the Yacht Club. We're going to have a look at the southern shore. So anywhere, as we can, we'll just have a quick pan across the air, anywhere around that southern shore of Corio Bay, you can generally find a comfortable anchorage. There's a couple of spots of more interest and a couple of spots to steer clear of. So, and the RU means ruins. This is... Um, one of the relics of a bygone era, which would have been the early uh, 20th century, when my grandparents and their friends, um, when they wanted to go for a holiday uh, on Port Phillip, they would catch the ferry, and they would get the ferry to somewhere quite often around the Ballerine Peninsula, and we'll just scan out a little bit further because we're going to look at some of these spots later on. So we were just looking at Clifton Springs over here. They might have gone to Port Arlington, Indented Head... St Leonard's or Queenscliff right down the bottom there. We'll just have a look at Queenscliff down here. And it was quite popular. And there's a couple of spots around here where you can see the relics of that guest house type um, holiday and accommodation. And one of them is at Clifton Springs. So that area where you've got the, um, the jetty there is one of them. And we see here a little warning about anchoring. We see WD, which means weed. Um, weed is not so good for anchoring. We prefer sand or mud. So 
do make sure you've got a chart of some description with you and make sure that um, that it is set well and if you don't know how to anchor we'll deal with that in a separate session moving our way around the coast here there's another one of these marine farms and in most of the time in Port Phillip they're mussel farms which means that you can't navigate through them they've got lots of nasty things that are going to get tangled up around your boat proceeding up past Point Richards we'll stop and have a look at Port Arlington because Port Arlington does have a very nice anchorage in two spots one of them is inside the harbour one of them is outside the harbour so the first one's out here and that's quite a popular anchoring spot and anytime you go past here you'll often see a couple of yachts anchored out there and just using their dinghies to get ashore however the new harbour um, with its fully enclosed uh, breakwater also has this anchoring area in here now the you're going, what about the 1.3? Well, the answer is don't anchor too close in this way um, and try and stay out here. But that little basin in there is meant for anchoring. And the 1.3 is a little bit uh, misleading. Um, they did dredge most of it, and my experience of uh, testing that area around there is there is a good two metres of water a little bit further in than the um, contour line there indicates. And I'll just once again pan out a bit. We see that this is one of those areas where that dish-shaped Port Phillip doesn't quite apply. So we've got the thing called, here called the Prince George Bank. And just one look at the number of um, navigation aids that are uh, dotted around that area indicates that it's a slightly tricky area for navigation. But once again, the good news is that most of the obstructions are well marked. You can find your way around here. And these areas here are also excellent for anchoring, particularly as the wind turns to the southwest. Half Moon Bay, you can see a little wreck there. That's the wreck of the ozone. That was was one of the paddle steamers that used to ferry people up and down Port Phillip. But it's a local landmark that you can see on the way past. And you get round to as far as St Leonard's. There's St Leonard's. Got a little marker on it. It's disappeared again. We'll put it back again. And whilst it has a jetty, it's not particularly suitable for um, yachts. So the better trick if you do want to stop at St Leonard's is to anchor in this area out here and that's a well-known and designated anchorage. And from there you can get ashore in your dinghy onto the beach and it's a nice little sandy beach in there. Now we're approaching this area called the Great Sands. So I'm going to skip over that for the time being. We're just going to have a look at the southern peninsula area before we come back to uh, and finish off on the Great Sands. Once again, you can see these nice um, light blue areas around Rosebud, as far as um, Mount Martha. This is Mount Martha up here, or Safety Beach. That entire area around there, um, past Rosebud, is all uh, a, a good sandy bottom area for anchoring in until we get around to Sorrento, and I'm looking for Sorrento here. And whilst it doesn't quite classify as um, anchoring, Sorrento and the area around where I've got the little marker there, uh, this is a, a heavy mooring area. So there's lots of moorings in the water there and lots of boats on the moorings. You could choose to anchor there, but the easier option is that there are six Parks Victoria short-term moorings. And for more information on that, look up the Parks Victoria website and they'll even have pictures of them. But basically, there are very large orange boys. You need a dinghy to get ashore to um, find your way up into Sorrento. But at that stage, you're back into the, what is it, the Hurley Burley of not so much Melbourne, but a um, bayside suburb. The problem we have once we get into these areas is the tidal stream. So the water is actually moving as it moves in and out of the heads and it's moving quite appreciably. And that's what causes me to um, start the next little bit with a little bit of a caution, which is uh, the following couple of little hints are for experienced boaters. If you're not an experienced at anchoring and you're not experienced at navigating, then I'd suggest um, you don't get too ambitious just yet. But there's a couple of good spots that we can look at here, and I'm going to start off with the South Channel Fort. An artificially built island, uh, once again around the late 
19th century when they were fortifying the entrance to Port Phillip. Surprisingly enough, it wasn't um, to do with the Germans. It was the Russians at the time that they were concerned about. And uh, it was a post-gold rush because, of course, Melbourne was very valuable at that. So the South Channel Fort was an artificially built island and with a, quite a number of fortifications on it. And I'm not going to bring the pictures up at the moment, but you can make your way ashore at the jetty there. And there's two ways you could do that. You could either tie up at the jetty, but um, I'd recommend that's for experienced boat boaters and boat handlers only. Uh, you'll find it a, a bit of a um, struggle to deal with the tidal stream moving past the pier there. The better option perhaps is to anchor somewhere over here and take your dinghy in. The other one is to look at Mud Island here. And you can see that Mud Island is mostly surrounded by that dark blue water which is to all intents and purposes not navigable because it's um, too shallow for most of our boats certainly most of our yachts but there's a couple of spots where you can get rather close and this one over here is one of my favorites it's in a thing called the Loelia Channel the problem with the Loelia Channel and the Simmons Channel is that they're not marked so there's no age to navigation so you are going to need to know what you're doing and possibly doing it in daylight but you can find your way into somewhere like here um, or here where there's a reasonable depth of water drop anchor and take your dinghy in for a little explore and you'll find it quite rewarding once again it's a um, nature or conservation reserve so there are rules in place that it's worth checking before you do that the alternative was to come over and anchor on this side and do the same thing or down here somewhere I will finish off with one little thing that, that basically is that it looks tempting but don't even try it, Swan Bay. As we have a closer look at Swan Bay, we see that it's not very deep at all. And I tried um, sailing around here in a dinghy one day, a little mirror dinghy, and even that uh, kept touching the bottom to the extent that uh, even with the tide rising we found that it was... Um, would call not particularly viable trying to sail around in this. Thank you very much. That's, uh, that's it for now. If there's any questions, um, please write to us at uh, Wyndham Yacht Club. Bye-bye.